Hoy hablamos con Mark Prensky, escritor y conferenciante especializado en educación. Se le conoce por ser el inventor de términos como nativo digital e inmigrante digital. Prensky nació en Nueva York y se ha educado en las universidades de Harvard y Yale, entre otras. Ejerció como profesor en una escuela elemental en el barrio de Harlem y más tarde también fue profesor de instituto y acabó siendo docente en la Universidad de State Island de Nueva York. Durante años se ha dedicado al diseño de estrategias de aprendizaje basada en los videojuegos. Pero sin duda es un visionario, un visionario de la tecnología aplicada al aprendizaje, aunque su visión no siempre es compartida por los docentes. En Inédit Educación nos interesa mucho su opinión sobre la inteligencia artificial y qué retos implica para la educación. Empezamos. Why has there been so much uh, concern about ChatGPT chat in AI uh, in all contexts of society when artificial intelligence Uh, products have been around us for so long, like Alexa, Siri. So what's new now? What is happening? Before, up till a few months ago, AI was here in some instances, but it was under the radar. Nobody really knew they had it. So one of my favorite apps was the app in the, in the phone that takes your pictures that you have on your phone and makes a lovely video with sound of the past. They call them memories in some instances, and they're beautiful. But very few people, if they knew them, they didn't think they were AI. Uh, they, used, they used them maybe, but they didn't know consciously that this was AI. They didn't consciously know Siri was AI they didn't know this stuff. So it was very under the radar. And uh, the term artificial intelligence, which is a, a terrible term because it's not really what it is. It's a different form of intelligence uh, that wasn't known to enough people. And when yeah. it was, it was scary. But here's what happened. Three months ago, ChatGPT came in. And suddenly, people started to realize that humans have a new way of thinking. In the past, we had what Daniel Kahneman, and I am a big fan of his, that calls fast thinking, which was heuristics, and slow thinking, which was analytical thinking. And now, we have a new thing called statistical algorithmical thinking. And it doesn't think the same way at all as humans used to think. And it is really, really useful in so many ways that everybody needs to rethink what they're doing to include this type of thinking. And that's why we are saying, how can we use AI in schools? How can we use AI in education? How can we use AI in law? How can we use AI in everything that we do? So it is really a very huge change in human capabilities that okay. suddenly was published <laughs> yes. and is available to everybody. And that's why it's causing so much stir. Well, in fact, you know, people, when you listen, people like, uh, well, savvy, in technically savvy people like Elon Musk or jo Geoffrey Hinton uh, doing comparison uh, between AI and, and, and nuclear weapons. So that's, it's something that scares quite a lot, you know, to normal people. So Well, they do that deliberately because nothing gets attention faster than the word human extinction. Yeah. So if That's you talk it. to that, suddenly people are going to uh, pay attention perhaps, but it's, all, it's not really what is going on. That's a long-term potential consequence that may be possible. But we're, what we really are doing is looking at all the different consequences, positive and negative, and trying to figure out which ones we should use, which ones we should possibly control or think about more. And we're so early in this process. It's like, this is like a baby that was born three months ago. Yes. It's very hard to predict the life of that baby. And like a baby, it gets better and more capable every day. Yeah. So 
that's what we are in the process of needing to think about this. One group of people who wants their own kind of attention at, talks about extinction. That will get them more money, more investment. All people will pay attention. Yeah. But other uh, groups of people, I'm just going to finish the sentence. Yeah. Um, other, other groups of people are really thinking about how we can use this in, in very positive ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, about I I would like very much your point of view uh, with this this these words that sometimes uh, sounds like synonymous but you do a, a distinction very interesting I think for for everybody in a in a from a general vision uh, you use the term equipment instead of tool this could you explain to us the difference and what do you mean with each word the difference oh. between tool and equipment. Yes, and this is this is a recent thinking, and you helped spark it. Uh, thank you. The there's a lot of conversation about tools, and that how humans always have used tools, and tools have no uh, people say that tools have no good or bad. It depends on how you use them, and all of that, in a sense, is true. But that's not the best way to think about things. I think it's a much better to think about them as capabilities. And the way we get new capabilities in sports, particularly as an example, is through new equipment. And so when you get new equipment, you can do much different things. Take golf, for example, which started out with just sticks. And now it is these high tech uh, clubs and balls and all these things and we can do much more and so we're what when you change the equipment you change the game and that's what's happening or the other way when the game changes you need new equipment mm -hmm. so that is what's happening in the world the game of being alive of being human is changing We're having a different climate. We have more capabilities. We have many things. And one of the things that can hopefully help us with that is new equipment. Mm -hmm. Now, it's true that new equipment, say, in an army can make it more lethal, can make it better. But it is helping it do its job better. So that is interesting. There's another interesting distinction with equipment which doesn't uh, apply to tools, which is that there is amateur equipment and professional equipment. And golf is a great example, again, because there are things that the professionals are allowed to use and that they're not allowed to use. And we put those limits on. But the amateurs can use anything. They can use whatever they want. They can use whatever size tennis racket they want. They can use whatever they want to do because they're not being professional and they're not playing a fixed game. They're playing the game that they want to play. Well, now everybody plays the game that they want to play and the equipment that they use to play will have a lot of effect on what the game is. Perfect. I'm interested in knowing your opinion about what aspects are going to change in the classroom due to the use of artificial intelligence. And what does AI mean for curriculum? It You don't need a teacher to do the same things that a teacher did in the past. We still, it's, teachers have, two roles, or at least two roles. One is that they need to impart content. They mm -hmm. teach essentially a subject. And the second is that they are interested in helping kids. They chose to be a teacher either because they love the content, and those are not generally the best teachers, or because they love kids and want to help them. And those generally are the best teachers. What's going away, I think, with the AI is the content part. Can got, it can be had in so many other ways that are better. You can go to YouTube to learn something. You can go to Conmigo to learn something if you need that. So what's left, what 
hopefully will be the future, is helping young people, helping them realize their dreams, helping them fix problems, helping them help other people. Most of our education has been learning in advance. We say, if we put all these things into your head, when you become an adult, when you grow up, maybe someday you'll accomplish something useful. <laughs> now we're in a position because of this these new this new equipment that we have that we can say no start right away start when you're three years old yes i think uh, that this is on the way of the second question you know uh, until now as you said education was based on reading and writing that was like you know the the milestone of, of of the education, but now there are machines that they read and write for us. So should education look for new purpose? Should education seek for new new goals? Which ones, from your point of view? Yes, I think that that in the past, our goal in doing what we called education was to shape our kids and make them more into people like us. So we taught them the things that we already knew. We taught them the behaviors from our culture and our values, and we tried to make them into people like us. And that was essentially, that's the real role of education. Now, I think that's going to change because no matter what we do, they're not going to be people like us. They're going to live in a new world and be different people. And so we need a new goal. And my sense is the best goal that we can pick for these young people is to help them make their world a better world. Make, make new things, create new things that will help make their world a better world, fix the problems that we have caused that all the young people are concerned about. And every kid is born with dreams. I have never met a kid who doesn't have dreams. And that's what we should focus on. We should focus on helping kids realize those dreams, get those dreams out of their heads, not putting things into their heads, but bringing things out of their heads, mm -hmm. getting them to look at the problems they see, and kids see problems everywhere, and work towards fixing those problems, and get them to see people who need help and help those people. And that's a better goal, I think, for if you still want to call it education. I, I want to call agree. it something different. I want to call it something different. I want to call it empowerment. Mm -hmm. An empowerment, yeah. nice word. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> I totally agree. And now, you know, maybe uh, uh, when 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 people in, in those last months have a, a, a speaking about uh, AI, always is like, a, a, like people are f a scared of losing jobs. So in education, are teachers becoming to be obsolete? What is going to, to happen with teachers, with these uh, smarty machines around us? The role of the teacher is changing. I think it's still a good idea to have young people and, and adults work together as the kids grow up. But the role of putting information into kids' heads in advance, which is a lot of what teachers do these days. They're given a curriculum and they have to teach that curriculum. And that is their job. And in all over the world, that's what they're told their job is to do. And that is going away. What's not going away is the relationship of an adult to a young person. But that relationship has to be a positive one. That relationship has to not be, you have to learn this or at all costs. You Even if it's very stressful, even if it's not applicable to you, you have to learn it, algebra, because we say so. And that was maybe okay in the past, but now it really has to be, who are you? What are your dreams? What would you like to become? How do you think you can help the world? 
And I, as your teacher, am here to help you do that. That is my job. It's not to put things into your head that any politician or any other person has told me to. It's for me to understand you and with my experience and bringing in other resources, help you realize your dreams, fix problems you care about, and help people that you care about, and therefore make your world a better world. My job as a teacher is to help you do that. Is that something you're interested in? And my sense is that most young people would say yes. So I think there is a long, a long journey still for teacher <laughs> between us. Okay, let's go on. You are well known for being the first one using the concept of digital native. You are very famous for that. And uh, so could you explain now the difference between digital native and AI native? Shall we start to use this concept for describing our students or not yet? What do you think? I, th I thought about that and I thought about writing and what would it, what would an AI native be? And I don't think we really have any AI natives yet, people who were born in the AI age who were not over the age of three months. So what we have is people getting new equipment of all ages. And those people are have access, adults have access to it, kids have access to it, young people have access to it. And how they use it is what's, sh is what's in a sense, bifurcating, splitting in two. Uh, some don't use it adults at all, and some kids don't use it at all, I'm sure. But some use it all the time. And my son, for example, uh, who was 18 and just graduated from high school yesterday. Um, Congrats for both. Thank, thank <laughs> you. He is very happy that he's never going to ever have to see that place again. Yeah. Or, and, and, there was only, the <laughs> and there was only one teacher he went back to see who, was a, who he thought was a really uh, good person to help him. And guess what? He never went to that teacher's class. He just turned in the assignments. And, and it, was, uh, it was very nice. But here's what I think is, when I, look at, when I look at my son and I go into his room, he has two computer screens open. He's a technical guy. One of them just has ChatGPT. So whenever he has to do anything, he consults ChatGPT. And if he needs to make a design, if he needs to write something, if he needs to understand something, whatever it is, ChatGPT is his new partner and assistant. And I'm not there yet. I try to use it. I have it open, but I'm not using it yet for everything. I will. I hope I'll get there. But the And that is what's the difference is coming. And we will, so it's the people who accept this and use this and say, this is, wow, I can think in new ways. This is an assistant. It brings into my head all human knowledge and, and it applies it to exactly what I'm doing. And I don't know how to use it perfectly yet, but I'm figuring that out every day more and more. That's one group. The other group is people who are saying, not for me. And the group that says, this is something that just exists in the world. I was born with it, hardly exists at all. Those are the natives. And when those people grow up and get older and become students and then teenagers and then adults, they will be different people because they will be the AI natives who grew up in a world that never didn't have this assistant. And the old people, some of them, will look at them and say, oh, yeah, you have it so easy. We didn't have any of that stuff, just like people say we had to walk 20 miles to school. But it will be, this is, this is new equipment for everybody, and the natives will adopt it in the same way 
that we've adopted things like clothing and we've adopted and we don't go without this stuff or we've adopted things uh, like speech or we've adopted things like morality or we've adopted things like reading and writing. We don't go without it because it's so important and useful for us. And AI is going to be the latest of those things. It's not going to be separate from us. It is us. And therefore, uh, the when we become, and when everybody in the world is an AI native, it will be a different phase of humanity. Just you know, to to go ahead for for the end of this interview, um, in in my opinion, uh, as I told you, uh, I think we have put more effort until now into learning machines than in into a students learning. We put energy and resources uh, into trying machine things, machine runs, machine fields like we do, like humans. But we spend the teaching time in the schools trying students don't run, don't do that, control their action, their feelings. So uh, so what do you think? The risk is the risk in is in AI or is the risk uh, there is risk in the teaching behavior? Good question. I don't think controlling kids is a very good idea, but that's really what we do. We control them as parents. We control them as teachers. We control them as culture uh, because we want them to become people like us. So that a lot of effort in, and particularly in schools is spent, as you said, on controlling people. The interesting thing about the, the machines and thinking about them is that they should be a liberation for, for people, young people especially. The AI, the new world we're in, is a huge opportunity for teachers to stop focusing so much on content and behavior and start focusing on bringing young people into the future with confidence, without fear, with the idea that they can get things done. And one of the things that I've been talking about, and I started talking about this in Barcelona actually last year, yeah. uh, is, is not edutech which is what everybody talks about now. And when you said, put the focus on technology, everybody talks about ed tech. And ed tech is what people want to invest in now and have conferences on and think about that. I talk about instead, empotech, technology that empowers. Mm -hmm. And the nicest thing about AI and chat GPT and how it will grow, and we can't just look at it how it is, but we have to think about how it will grow, is that it is really a piece of empotech. Mm -hmm. It is really there to empower young people. And to do that, we all have to figure out how to use it properly, which nobody knows, because it's new for everybody. The only thing that may differentiate older people from younger people, and it may not, is that the younger people will be more open to using it faster. And the people who are more open to using it faster are the people who will be the intermediate natives, not the true natives, because the true natives will be born with it, but they will be. And this was the same when I talked about um, digital natives that people were very, the people who complained about the term complained that not every adult was one way and not every young person was another way. And that was true. But what there was, was emerging people who were forward thinking in moving to the future. And those were the first digital natives And then they became true digital natives as they started to grow up in an age where all they had was digital, where it existed from their birth. So I think this is, I think AI is a, uh, an immense opportunity 
for teachers, for educators, for for people who want to help young people. That's an it's in that sense. It's not education in the sense of putting things into kids' heads. It's empowerment in the sense of bringing things out of kids' heads. And I just remember, audience, that uh, they will find uh, a link in our description uh, with an article we wrote last year when you were in Barcelona about the concept Empotec. I think it, this is a title, Empotec. So uh, you will find, look uh, down in, in, in our description. And uh, let's follow with the next question. Just we are arriving, we are arriving to the end. And um, an advice, this is a time for a good advice. So what advice would you give teachers about managing their relationship with AI in, in the classroom? Mark. That's a, that, that everybody is trying to think about that, uh, that question now. And the real question is, do we need classrooms? That is really the underlying good question. question. And the reason for that is because we had classrooms so that a teacher could teach a group of people, a group of students that were put together for whatever reason, mostly by age, they could teach them all at once. That's more efficient. It means less resources are needed. And we don't need that anymore because now we have between Conmigo and YouTube and all the other things that we have, we have efficient ways of imparting the information when somebody needs it. And we have ways now with Conmigo, with AI, that are very close to the best tutor. And so that job is not really a job anymore or a useful job anymore for the future. So the question is, then what do we do? Now we have all these groups of 20 to 40 kids in these things called classrooms that are built in these things called schools. What do we do? And so because what the first assumption people make is, well, we're not going to change that. We're not going to change the, the structure, the physical structure. So what do we do in those rooms? Uh, and we're not going to change one teacher and 30, 40 students, so what do we do? Well, that's what those are the two things that really need to change. So the people who are building newer schools are not making classrooms for 30 or 40 people anymore. They're making small spaces where a team of four to six people can work on a project. And some of and that can happen indoors. It can even happen outdoors. It can happen virtually. You can put in the equipment and it can happen virtually so the team members can be around the world. And for and then there are certain things where having many students together is useful. So for that, you have auditoriums, you have sports facilities. You have things that that are good because there are times when we want to bring a lot of people together and do something with them all. But the main day-to-day -day stuff, I think, needs to be in much smaller groups. And that is hard to do in a classroom. So there are lots of new roles that teachers could play. But in order to do that, you have to move conceptually from the idea that you're gonna, we're going to deliver a curriculum and put it into people's heads to the conceptual idea that we're going to bring innovations out of kids' heads and out of teams of kids' heads uh, by having them do projects and accomplish and do it over and over again and have a process of, of reflection and review in that loop. And that is what's emerging as as really what I call an alternative paradigm. Yeah, I think that that teacher, everything you have said, uh, I think any kind of teacher will be agreed uh, with you. And uh, I think one of the here has been, as I told you before recording the, the interview, has been, it's been, in fact, 
uh, still, it's been a really, really hard year for teacher because they have they are facing lots of changes from politician from from education politics and um and then I think I know I know that you are an advisor of very power people a politician also so um maybe if uh, if there is any politician uh, watching this video so and 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 this politician works for education and matters so what would you say to to a politician for education not on, because the teacher are they agree with you they are always fighting to to have a, a lower ratios ratios in in the classrooms but it's like a, well an, an effort a lost le effort it, mm -hmm. i agree, i hear what you're saying and i support and i love all those teachers whose real goal is to help young people and that they are they have become teachers and educators because that's their goal and what is difficult is that we are in a system and it's a worldwide system it's the same in just about every country yeah. that is set up in a certain way to do a certain thing, to put things into kids' heads, subject by subject, starting with reading and writing, and then going into math and language and science and social studies. And that's the world system. That's the world paradigm. If you spend six or 12 or 20 years, like I did, doing that, then you'll be prepared to go do something else. And what we're discovering is that doesn't work as well as it used to, because you go out into a world where you have to start at the very beginning anyway, no matter how much education you've had, you've got to learn to accomplish because you've never accomplished. So nobody gives you responsibility in your first job or very much, even though you've had 20 years of school because school didn't teach you that. That's one thing. The second thing is that what, people are doing these days in their jobs is different. We don't have, and I have a, a good friend who's also Spanish, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez, who looks at this problem of projects and notices that the companies are not hiring people for jobs anymore. They're hiring people for projects. Mm -hmm. So you have to be ready to contribute to a project. How do you yeah. get ready for that? You do project after project after project mm -hmm. as you're growing up. And that is what is is not something that we do. We've started a tiny bit. There's a little thing, there's a thing called PBL, which is called project-based learning. Well, that's not yeah, that's good in that it makes teams, but it's mm -hmm. not good in that it's still trying to teach the old curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's not projects that impact the world. It's impacts that, Im that impact you in terms of the curriculum. That's not enough. We have to go beyond that. Plus, sometimes there are projects, sometimes they call them service projects, and they have these in, in some, of the, some of the schools and in the um, International Baccalaureate, for example. Yeah. And those projects are nice, but they're one-time projects. And they are projects that are not necessarily designed to help the world in any lasting way. Mm -hmm. They're projects that are designed to show off what some young people could do. So if you go to, as, and there's a great, uh, let me give you a great example of how this can happen. So, so young people, where once a friend of mine created a game, it was an archeology span game. And they found, they had to go and search for pieces of whatever it was that they found. And they found pieces of pots and they were just, and then they had to, they put them all together and they made a pot. And that pot had something in Greek. So guess what? The kids had to go out and learn some Greek to be able to read that. And that's what happens in life. You come across something you want to do. You're a journalist and somebody comes to you and said, well, this would be best as a video. And you say, I don't know how to make video. Like I had to say when I was a writer, 
you say, okay. And then you learn to make video. Then you learn. And and yeah. that is the time when the learning, suddenly the learning is, is fun and it's urgent and you want to do it because you're trying to accomplish something. And that is such a, it's such a big switch for people because we just haven't thought that way in the past. We thought, and it's a function of when we come from, we thought that young people were not capable of doing things. They were not capable of improving the world. They had to go through all this school before they could do that. And that was true through the 20th century. It was through, true through my generation, maybe your generation. It isn't as true anymore. Yeah. Kids are very powerful to accomplish yeah. things. All right. uh, Thank you very much. I have to. <laughs> to, to you go have to, to go. To the okay. End. I, I have yeah. another example of Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Okay. Go on. <laughs> okay. So, so one of the things that's really important is that the young people don't realize their power. And I have to they, tell you agree with that. <laughs> and and so we're going to see this happen. And a great example of that is Greta Thunberg. And Greta Thunberg is very passionate about, about climate change, and she got very frustrated in using the tools of the 20th century, which first were protesting and then uh, mass communication and talking to important audiences like the UN. And, the world. and she still was very frustrated. Well, she wasn't using the tools of her time. She was so she started using the technology to get people organized to do what she called Fridays for Future, the strikes on Friday. And that had a little effect, but I think she's still frustrated and it wasn't bigger. Well, here's the power Greta really has. If she wanted to, she could recruit every young person in the world to go on strike permanently until climate change started to happen. I went to different strikes. On, yeah. yeah, but yeah, suppose that. that strike was not one day yeah. in one place. Suppose that day that strike was worldwide. All the parents would be so upset. All the adults would be so upset. Mm -hmm. They would start to say, maybe we should do something. Mm -hmm. So the kids are so much more powerful if they are willing to use that power and if they understand it. So I hope they will. I really do. They are. They are. I I really, really agree with you because and, and then also I will I will add another article in the description because we 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 we're all about young a teenager or even less than teenager before like uh, um girls and boys at the age of 10 years or nine years that they have done amazing projects for for in Africa and and so I will I will leave the description. Absolutely. That Absolutely. The, Mention design for change because design for change, yeah. which is has a big presence in Spain, mm -hmm. is yeah. the organization that yeah. is doing the most to yeah. promote this. It's it's not it's struggling to combine it with the curriculum because it that's very hard, but it's finding the teachers who want to do this with yes. their students and making yes. it happen. And I can connect you with those people and you'll really enjoy them. Thank you. In fact, I think I'm very optimistic always, but I think that there are a lot of changes happening in the education, a part of the curriculum and, and the entrepreneurship as a, as a subject, uh, uh, as a, 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 a knowledge area is happening and it's, it's getting introduced in the, in, the, in the curriculum. So there are a lot of things Changes. There are a lot of teachers that they are involved in these things happen, and um, I think that the so the IA again that is the is the main the subject in, in this the AI. today. Yeah, sorry, I always confuse because in Spain in Spanish, in Spanish it's Spanish, it's uh, right? Yes. So I wrote a paper in front of my my laptop, you know, to remember AI AI because <laughs> I am a little bit dyslexic also. So. Okay. Anyway, Mark Prensky, I will spend the whole afternoon speaking with you. And uh, I, I'm, a, as I told you, I'm really fun from of all your ideas. And uh, but it's time that we have to finish this interview. Just 
saying thanks, many, many thanks for sharing your time with us. And let's keep in touch uh, and see you how, I, how AI gets involved in our daily lives. So, well, so, hasta luego. Hasta Muchas luego. gracias. And hasta I would luego. say one thing. These are yeah. not just ideas in my head. These are ideas that are in your head already, that they're in many people's heads around the world. And what I'm trying to do is to bring all those people together so we can collectively make some really necessary improvements for our young people. Yes, I will. I completely sure that I will. And uh, and this will be a better place for, for, for children and for us also. Take care. Thank you very much and hope see you soon in any Congress or in any part of the world. Bye. Un abrazo. Sí, chao, chao. Hasta luego. <laughs>